All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get uh, let's get rolling. Thank you so much for being here at the Beer Garden, the Brewery X Beer Garden here at Honda Center in Anaheim. Um, of course, my name is Kent French, and I work uh, with the organization and also Bally Sports West. Uh, and I also like to welcome all of our viewers that are viewing us right now on the Bally Sports app. I hope uh, everyone so far has had a tremendous summer. This is an exciting time for the Anaheim Ducks franchise. Obviously, we're celebrating 30 years as an organization, and now we get to introduce a brand new head coach. So again, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we are fired up and ready to go. But before we get started here, I do want to introduce a few, uh, uh, I consider everyone VIPs, but of course I got some very special VIPs here up in the front. Uh, first and foremost, our owners, Henry and Susan Samueli. Thank you for being here. Great to see you. As always, you can clap if you want. Seriously, let's go. Yes. Michael Schulman. Always good to see you, sir, chairman of the board, OC Vibe Sports and Entertainment. You can clap for him as well. And then we roll over to, I just like to call him the man, Aaron Teets. He is the president of the Anaheim Ducks. Aaron, welcome, as always. Okay, now we get started. Very excited to introduce our brand new head coach, the 11th in team history, Greg Cronin. His first stint as an NHL head coach, bringing 36 prior years of coaching and player development experience. Uh, he brings 12 years of experience as an NHL assistant in addition to seven seasons as an American Hockey League head coach and eight seasons as a head coach in the NCAA. He joins Anaheim after spending five seasons as a head coach of the Colorado Eagles, which of course is the Colorado Avalanche's primary development in the AHL. He led the Eagles to a 164-104 30 record. If you're scoring at home, that is pretty darn good. And also guided the club to Calder Cup playoff appearances in four of his five seasons there. Now as head coach in the AHL with the Colorado and Bridgeport, Cronin led his teams to a 242, 165, and 51 record in 400 and 58 games. Now in Colorado, Cronin oversaw the development of numerous players in the Avalanche organization. Three players, though, I want to point out, they helped the Avs win the Cup in 2022, including Alex Newhook, Logan O'Connor, and Pavel Francis. He also helped 18 players make their NHL debuts with the Avs after spending time under his leadership with the Eagles, which we are very excited because you know what we are doing here. We are building a winning organization, and we cannot wait for Greg to get started. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Greg Cronin, Anaheim's brand new head coach. Now, as we uh, roll on with this press conference, I'd like to give our GM, Pat Verbeek, uh, a few moments here for some opening comments. You've uh, got some really, a lot of notes there, Pat. No, no it'll go fine, okay. fast. Thanks, Frenchie. Um, well, this is a very exciting day for the Anaheim Ducks. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Susan and, and Henry Samueli, uh, Michael Schumann and Aaron Teets for your, your tremendous support uh, going through this process. Um, we casted a wide net and, uh, and it's been an exhaustive process and through that process I'm, I'm really excited and uh, couldn't be happier with the result. Um, we are excited to welcome Greg Cronin as our 11th coach. Um, and in my personal opinion, I, I think this has been long overdue. Um, and I, I think he's going to be a tremendous fit for our hockey club. Greg has obviously has been mentioned before. He has extensive uh, experience, 36 years um, in developing players, coaching players uh, in the NHL, AHL, college, and uh, the U.S. development program. He brings a passion and an energy that is contagious. And as I went through this process of, um, you know, talking to different coaches, I was looking for someone um, that could develop a culture with high standards and compete work ethic and accountability. Greg has an ex outstanding track record in those areas. Not only am I excited for our organization to uh, have Greg as our head coach. I'm also really excited for our young players. They're going to really gain an extensive knowledge of, um, of the game, but also learn a whole new skill set um, to make sure that they better their game. 
I'm also really excited for our veteran players. I think that he's going to reinvigorate them and give them a brand new perspective uh, moving forward with the game. And with that, I want to welcome uh, Greg Cronin as our next head coach. Again, just to reiterate, reiterate what Pat said, I want to thank um, Henry uh, and, and Susan, Michael, and Aaron Teets. I had an opportunity to have dinner with, with uh, Henry and Michael and Aaron. We had a, a good conversation, and I felt really comfortable um, just sharing my vision with the owners. And uh, I've had a real long journey with Pat. I've met Pat three separate times without having any history with Pat at all. And um, it's funny how, like, I've been doing this for 36 years, and it's always about networking and who you know. Uh, I'm kind of a stay-in-my-lane guy, and I work. And I think that every time you have an opportunity to uh, grow in another organization or move laterally, you meet people. And um, fortunately for me, there was a gentleman by the name of Craig Billington who was my GM in Colorado uh, with the Eagles who had a history with Pat. And uh, he had talked to me about Pat and how he thought Pat and I would mesh as people and share a, a similar vision. And, um, you know, obviously everybody knows who Joe Sackick is, and, and Joe spoke uh, highly of Pat and thought at this particular moment with the Ducks where there's a, a real uh, influx of new talent coming in, that my skill set as a coach uh, would mesh really well with what Pat's trying to do here and his staff in terms of building a championship team. So. Um, we met for a long time, and, and again, I make a joke that Pat's a pig farmer from Western Ontario, and I'm a Boston guy, and how do two of those personalities mesh so well? But I never really had a, a conversation with somebody that was probably budgeted for two hours, uh, lasted five hours, and then the next one was a seven-hour meeting where I got into the mechanics of how I coach and the process involved. And, and uh, it's interesting, you know, kind of a window into that discussion. I mean, Pat played a long time has over a thousand points, a uh, thousand games, uh, different view of the hockey world than I might have coming through um, a Division II college hockey player and then working my way up as a coach uh, through different levels um, from University of Maine. I won't go through the whole thing, but from college to uh, the U.S. National Training Program, which is a premier program that I was fortunate to start, and then on to um, the NHL route. And uh, so different views of the game uh, and, you know, Pat moves on as a manager watching it from, a, from up above. And I always tell my players there's three views of a, of a, of a person's uh, identity as a hockey player. One's through his own eyes, one's through the eyes of above, like the media, you're watching from the balcony and you're watching a game and that creates a visibility. And then ultimately on the battlefield where the opposing player sees the stiffness of a player, the confidence, uh, the battle level and all that stuff, and the coaches see that. And, and Pat's been through all that, and I have been as well, but through a coach, not from a player. But we really, really were compatible with what we felt um, needed to be done to maximize potential. And this is a growth league, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it was a win now, I think, years and years ago, but now there's some patience to it, particularly with the young kids coming through and the development model that I explored in the American League in the last five years and going back 20 years ago when I was in Bridgeport. And um, I think we mapped all of that out, and I felt pretty good about it, but you just never know. And, and um, you know, and I think, as you know, I think Pat's pretty proud of his ability to keep things under the lid. And that this didn't get out until this morning, so we, we worked together to make sure it was a private process. And uh, I'm just ecstatic to be here. Um, I think this is right up my wheelhouse as a coach. I think the... The experience I had in Colorado with a great staff and with the support from the Avalanche will transfer really well uh, to the NHL level. And um, I'm just really blessed to be here. And I, I want to you know, also uh, give a thanks to my, my parents who have passed, they passed away five years ago. I know they'd be thrilled uh, looking down. Um, I've worked my tail off to get to this point. And uh, like I said, I can't emphasize enough uh, how happy I am to be here. And I was, I was joking around prior to the press conference about the number of texts I've gotten from players as far back as the 80s when I was coaching at UMaine. And um, I was fortunate to coach Paul Correa, uh, whose jersey's in the ceiling here. And 
Um, I want to give a real uh, strong thank you to uh, two people that were in, in, instrumental in my decision to go from an MBA graduate at UMaine to a coach, um, and that's Sean Walsh, who passed away at the young age of 44, who I think was way ahead of his time, was really the, the engineer behind Maine Hockey's national championships, and a, another gentleman who's 88 years old named Grant Stanbrook, who um, has his fingerprints on probably 40 players in the NHL since he was at Wisconsin with Bob Johnson. He was able to take athletic skill sets and convert them into hockey players. And um, those two people made a huge impact on my growth as a coach. So uh, I just want to give them a shout out. And I probably answered some of the questions that you have down the pipe here for me. But uh, I'm just grateful to be here. So thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're going to take some questions from uh, all of you out there in the audience. And Steve Brown has a microphone. So he is, if you'd raise your hand, he'll come around. Please. Uh, Tell us where you're from and please who you're directing your question to. And as always, we'll start in the back with Trent Krim, Independent. <laughs> yeah, that's the second time you've used that one. That's pretty good. Uh, you think like that? No I one, think, it I took think a while would, for them to catch on. I, again. See, there's a lot of people that weren't here last time, so I had to go with it. That's a good one. Good Thank one. you. I, I like appreciate it. that. Thank you. you. As, long as, the well that as long as you're with me, Pat, that's all that matters. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> in all seriousness here, uh, we got questions out there. Please raise your hand. Steve Brown will come around. Oh, there you are. Hey, Eric Stevens. Hi, Kent French. How long have you been working on that one, by the way? <laughs> a couple weeks. It's been okay. a couple months right. for sure. <laughs> Not bad. Uh, this is a question for Greg. Uh, Eric Stevens with The Athletic. Congratulations, first of all, uh, on, the, um, on being named coach. For you, Greg, uh, I know you've interviewed for other uh, NHL head coaching positions previously. Mm -hmm. um, but with all your experience, what's over, how do you view this opportunity for yourself just personally with, with all your experience in, in various levels of hockey and uh, and, and whatnot to uh, just how do you view this, you know, even on a personal level? And did you ever think that this was going to come for you? Uh, thanks, Eric. And um, the so a year ago, I was involved with the Bruins open position and um, very different dynamic there with the older team. <clears throat> They're this close to winning a cup. And um, I think Don Sweeney and Cam Naley were looking for a personality that might be a little bit different than Butch Cassidy's after his eight years as a coach there and um, it was a great experience, great opportunity and they went with Jimmy Montgomery and he did a heck of a job. Um, if you would have asked me uh, that, that position compared to this position in terms of what fits my strengths, I would say this position does just because it's like I was talking earlier about the timing in your career. I've been in so many uh, organizations that needed rebuilds going all the way back to um, you know, the New York Islanders and Mike Milbury was there, and we had young guys like Zidane Chara. He, he ends up being a first ballot, a Hall of Famer. He was a young kid, 19, 20 years old, and, you know, my background and development from the University of Maine and the U.S. National Program uh, meshed really well with that. And then we were able to take guys like, you know, Tim Connolly, Taylor Pyatt. I'm going to miss a bunch of guys, Rafi Torres, that were in that mixture and convert them into assets, and Mike ended up trading them. But... That was a good fit for me. And then I, I go to North, uh, Northeastern, which is a program that's really bankrupt in a lot of ways. And that was a total rebuild. And I, I'm a big believer that the, you know, your communication skills, your ability to communicate a vision that's uh, exciting for players and that's got credibility to it um, is the first step in, in, um, in building anything. And the trust part of it's really, really big. And I think my, my years coaching is a big part of, I think, players having trust in what I'm coaching works. And uh, to make your, your, your question longer, you know, going back, the, the Maple Leafs are a different animal, obviously, but they had made the playoffs in 10 years. And I was there with Randy Carlisle, a former Duck coach, and we made it. And, um, and again, I think there was a lot of young guys involved in that mixture. So, it's just been kind of my, my path has been filled with that type of dynamic. And, and uh, I think Pat and his staff are really building an exciting new future with a lot of young players. You guys are probably more aware than I am in terms of the players coming through juniors. But I, I can't wait to get started. At least it's done with the orange. 
Lisa Dillman with the Orange County Register. Um, were those the longest interviews you've ever taken part of in a job uh, process? <laughs> Unbelievable. Like, I, here's the crazy thing. We didn't, I didn't take a drink of water. Pat didn't give me one either. I didn't offer him one. <laughs> and so now whenever we're together, he's getting a drink of water, whether he likes it or not. Then he had the TV going the first one, and I got like ADHD, so I was like, is he going to turn the TV off? But uh, they were long, and, um, but when, when they're long and they, and they time's flying by and you're sharing ideas, I literally looked at my watch and I was shocked that it, four and a half hours had passed before we acknowledged we were, we were going for a long time. And then the, the second one, which I think was more meat and potato with video and systems and breaking down how all this kind of folds together, uh, that was really enjoyable as well. Um, it's kind of like if you go on a date and the date lasts an hour or less than an hour, it's probably not going to work. But if it goes a long time, it's probably a good match. Um, just to follow up, the people I've talked to have said you've obviously paid your dues and then some. Do you, do you see some parallels with your path and, and Jared Bednar in the last organization you were with? Yeah, it's funny you brought that up. I was thinking about Jared on the ride up here. So a, a, an interesting twist to that question, Jared had applied for the assistant coaching job with the New York Islanders when I had gotten fired from Toronto. And Gar Snow, who I coached both at Maine and in New York, was the GM with the Islanders back then. And um, Jared and I were the two finalists, and I got the job and Jared didn't. So Jared went back to um, Cleveland to coach, and then they won a championship. So it's funny how, how life is with his twists and turns. and. There's a guy that has paid his dues. I mean, he goes through the East Coast League and the AHL, and Jared and I talk about it often about, you know, I always look at adversity as an opportunity to grow and learn. And he talks about his experiences going to Abbotsford as an assistant coach in the American League after getting fired in Peoria and doing a rebuild there and then uh, getting his opportunity to go back to being a head coach. So there are parallels. and. Um, I've learned a lot from Jared, and they've got a really unique team that are a different stage in their, in their growth than we are here, but um, terrific guy, terrific coach, and another one that kind of stays in his lane and does his job. Hey, Greg, Trent Rush here from AM830. Congratulations uh, Thanks, on the Trent. opportunity. Uh, in regards to building a, a team and developing talent, there's no secret there's a lot of young talent with this Ducks organization. How does that adjustment work at the, ma or the, uh, the NHL level, maybe in comparison to, to building at the AHL level? How do you envision maybe the differences up here in the NHL? Well, I, I'm going to use a quote that I pulled off of a Bill Belichick, Tom Brady special that some of you might have watched on the ESPN Plus channel. And, and um, Brady was talking about Belichick's mantra is practice execution equals game reality. And you can't coach what you don't know, right? So I'm one of these guys that's an, I believe in innovation. I believe in change and, and trying to provide plays. You've got to have a healthy balance, but it starts with your habits. And if your practice habits are not good, they're going to follow you right into the game. I believe that. It's not just a, it's not just a in the box football quote. It's an athletic quote. And I live by that. And we, you know, we had a, well, he wasn't, I wasn't coaching at the time, but Jason Magna was here for a long stretch of the season. And, he played for us in Colorado for three years, and he'd been all over the place. He's 32 years old, a well-rounded well player, a really mature person. And I would ask him, and I would ask um, Brad Hunt, who was with the Avalanche for a good chunk of the year, they'd been around a long time, um, if they felt that what we do in Colorado would work in the NHL. And I know it works, because I had you know, a guy that, like uh, Stromey, Ryan Strom was in New York when I was there as a young player. and. Um, we taught those things in New York, and I know they work. And I talk about them being athletic principles and say, well, you can't carry these things from the AHL to the NHL because it's the NHL. I, I say that's BS. I mean, you never stop learning. And uh, we're not trying to overwhelm players, just giving them more weaponry to use when they're defending or attacking. Uh, Greg Beecham with the Associated Press. Hey, Greg, you, expanding on that a little bit, who are the coaches that shaped you as a coach, and how would you describe your management style? Okay, so um, I talked about Sean, and uh, I could go on and on about him. He was just uh, way ahead of his time, a dynamic guy, unbelievable communicator, very inclusive person, contagious personality. I was joking around with Pat, like he was the guy that could make the Zamboni driver think he was on the first power play. He had that much confidence in what he was selling people. 
uh, and he evolved uh, as a person as well to be, um, I think, uh, a very, um, I would say, mature person, a little bit egotistical in the beginning, but I think he, ma he matured to uh, being a guy that was um, kind of like a godfather. And then um, Mike Milbury, um, who the media, you know, he was on TV quite a bit, and he was a, kind of an explosive personality and, and contagious uh, for different reasons. But um, Mike was a type of guy that didn't use semantics talking. Like, he wasn't worried about emotional band-aids. Pat played in that generation where you used honesty as a, as a tool to get into a player's heart. And Mike said something to me. At, uh, I was 35, I think, coaching the Islanders, and I bet you four or five guys were older than me. Kind of intimidating back then. Um, Gino Ojic was on that team. Um, I go on and on. Richie Pilon. And um, I don't know. I'll go through. Though. There was Ziggy Palf. There's a lot of guys. Uh, Sergey Nemchinov was probably 40 back then. And um, Mike was talking, uh, was watching me do a meeting. And I kind of tiptoed around a message that I was worried about um, the player getting his feelings hurt. And I'll never forget Mike grabbed me in the old. Coliseum, which was a rickety old building, there was these doorways that were kind of like caves, and he brought me in the doorway, and he said, if you're going to sugarcoat a message, then just get in your car and drive back to Boston. And that hit me right between the eyes. That, And he, he followed it up with, it doesn't matter where you came from or how old you are. He said, players want to know that you care about them, that you're honest, and you're going to give them a positive message. And that stuck with me. And I think when you run into people like that, uh, that have that ability to hit you between the eyes. And Mike would say all the time, it's about getting to a player's soul. I never heard that, like getting the message to a player's soul. And uh, that stuck with me. And he was a big part of my, my growth as a coach, particularly in the NHL. Um, and I liked Randy. Like Randy Carlisle was, you know, we were joking around. Randy's uh, kind of a rough and tumble guy. The exterior is a little bit sandpaperish and, and thorny. But he's a clever guy, a brilliant hockey mind. Uh, and, and Pat played with him. He's got a great sense of humor. But Randy's ability to see the game from the bench and then translate it, that into messages on the bench with players real quickly was impressive to me. And, and another guy that I thought was really unique, and that was Butch Goring. And I coached with Book, Butch in New York. And he, he, didn't, you know, he wins four Stanley Cups. He's 160 pounds soaking wet when the game was full of tough guys. He was another guy that understood the game. You hear him on TV, he sees little things, and I was blessed to be around him. Anybody else? Hi, Ali Lozoff, Anaheim Ducks rinkside reporter. Congrats and welcome, Thank you. Greg. Pat, um, a question for you. I was wondering. Oh, I thought I was going to be able to go through <laughs> this whole thing and not have to answer one. Um, I just wonder what character traits of Greg stood out to you during the interview process that made you certain that this is the person for the role? Well, I, I, part of when I went through this process, there was a, a few things that was important, but I really wanted to feel the energy um, talking to the person. And like I mentioned before, there was a really good energy. And to me, that's going to translate over to the players. Um, and that was important. Um, one of the other things that was, there was two things that were really important, but one of the criteria, you know, that I wanted, you know, as I listed the criteria that, to go, you know, find the next coach was being a teacher and a coach. And what I, what I mean by that is, you know, the coach creates the culture uh, of work ethic, compete, accountability, the structure of the systems you're gonna play. But what impressed me the most, and, and this is probably what separated him from the rest of the group, was is the intricate details um, that he could lay before, before myself, like in a step-by-step -step process of the basic fundamentals. And when I went, through and when he went through that with me as a former player I would crave that you know and I that to me is what separated you know when we got through that and so the teaching part was um, was what put him over the top in my opinion 
Hi, Leon Raffner, NBC Radio. A question for Greg, maybe Pat also. Uh, I know you've met a lot of new players over the years as you're coaching, but here you have to go through an entire team's roster and learn about the players and evaluate them. How does that process work for you? Do you want to do that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, good question. Um, I watched a, a lot of tape before I met with Pat, and uh, I'm big into the breaking down video in a meaningful way. You don't want to overload the players, so I try to overload the coaching staff so what we share with the players is digestible. Um, like I talked about earlier, the honesty piece of it. So you always, I would say you coach the person, not the player first. So that, that relationship is critical. And um, that's where you find out character, mental toughness, goal setting, what's the player's goal, going back to that image of what's going, who, what somebody's seeing from the press box versus what's going on on the ice, and then what's going on between his ears. Um, that to me is where the journey starts with the individual relationship with the player. And then um, putting that, that vision of what he thinks he is into what we want him to be in terms of maximizing the team. I think there's a certain skill to doing that. I'm very comfortable in those conversations because at the end of the day, it's all about the team. And, um, and I think as I move forward in training camp, because as Pat talked about, there will be standards. There's very controllable standards, and I say this all the time. There's certain things that are very doable. Everybody's going to compete at an extraordinary level. That's kind of my mantra. And then you've got to always attach your compete level to your brain. So you've got to be smart in how you do it, and that's what Pat was talking about, the detail. So when you arrive at a battle, there's going to be a requirement. When we talk about this quite a bit, weaponizing the player so when they do get there, they're able to actually accomplish the goal. And uh, I think at first, just watching the tape, some of the guys are going to be, it's going to be new to them. But I'm really confident that, and I talked about this all the time, it's repetition builds that habit, that we will get it out of them. And at that point, I, I really feel confident that not just me, but Pat and the organization will get a sense of what players can and, can and cannot do in that system. Derek Lee with the Sporting Tribune. First off, Greg, congratulations and welcome to Anaheim. In regards to your coaching staff, is the plan for you to just bring the rest of your staff from Colorado with you to Anaheim? No, and, 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 and Pat's going to play a big role in this. Um, I know Mike. I coached against Mike Stuthers when he was in Ontario and all the way back when we were in the American League 20 years ago. And I know Newell. I've known Newell for a long time. So um, I have talked to them, and they're... they're um, they're going to be part of the process. And Pat and I will go through candidates, and I'm sure Pat's played with guys and worked with guys that may, may be good fits here. So uh, as we move forward, um, you know, past this press conference, we'll work together to find two really good people. Greg, you've outlined, uh, obviously, some of the reasons why you know, this job is very, very appealing to you. Um, obviously, the on-ice results here in Anaheim haven't been up to what, you know, most people have wanted, uh, certainly here. But in that sense, though, with the young talent that is already here, the young talent that is going to be on the way, presumably, coming, do you feel like you're maybe sort of getting, getting in on the ground floor of something? Does that make it additionally invigorating for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, the timeline is the, the tricky part is, is and, and Pat and I have talked about this, and it's always part of the discussion. When I was in New York, uh, Jack Capuano was the coach, and we had four defensemen that were like the next wave of D-man coming through. We had older D-1, you remember Vishnovsky and um, I forget the other the other, there was another Czech or Slovak defenseman we had that were, uh, that were in that group, but they were kind of an older, older defensive group. Hamannik and, and Dehan were kind of our top pairing, but uh, the Mayfields, the Pulaks, the Pelich, Tays, um, Kyle Burrows, who eventually came through that, that group, they were the next group coming up. And, um, you know, Goth Snow made a decision um, to be patient with them. So they stayed in, in Bridgeport for a couple years and w worked on the process and how to defend 
properly and, and stiffly. And um, Pelich was the first guy that kind of broke through. And then Mayfield came and Pulak came, and that's kind of the backbone of their success. They were only a series away from a Stanley Cup final with that group. And I, I don't know these players because I haven't seen them like I've seen the, those Islander players, but I think that we're, particularly with the defense, we're in that process right now of determining you know, how long does it take guys to spend in the American League, and Pat can speak to his philosophy on that. But uh, that's why I think this job is, is really tailor-made for me, because I want to be involved in that building good habits and creating a vision for those players. Uh, Pat, I'll ask you one. Uh, just how much did you, in, in your conversations with Greg, whatsoever, how much did you emphasize that this process um, could still have maybe some bumps, um, maybe some tough moments along the way before you take leaps and bounds? No, I, I think that's uh, when you spend enough time in hockey, you understand the process. I mean, Greg spent numerous years developing players, so he understands you know the process and how long it takes. Um, Greg is, uh, you know, he thinks that we can do it faster. I, and I'm going to say, well, we're going to take the slow way just to make sure that every player is ready to play in the NHL because when they do get there, I want them to stay there. I don't want them going back and forth. So um, we, you know, we have the same philosophy from that, from that perspective. Anyone else? So we're all good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, please, one more time, welcome Greg Cronin as the new coach of the Anaheim Ducks. Greg and Pat, thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. And uh, there will be a photo op for all you in the back. Uh, we're going to bring up a jersey right now. Thank you, Steve. All right, well done, everybody, and uh, please uh, join us for refreshments from uh, California Pizza Kitchen, and we thank you so much once again for joining us here this afternoon, and go Ducks, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.